Let's talk about our second messengers. Uh, of course, like I mentioned, sticky board, post in the chat box. Um, the more interactive we can make this, the more uh, interesting it'll be for everyone. So I like to you know take a few moments to you know, answer questions if they pop up. So that way it kind of gives me a kind of interrupts me a little bit and gives me a, a second to kind of slow down a bit. But um, anyway, so you know we talked a lot about you know what a drug is. We talked about receptors. We talked about um, you know how they inter what types of receptors there are well you know things like the cell surface receptors we talked about like the g protein coupled ones well let's talk about what happens after that right so we know that the drug interacts with the receptor we know then something happens and your blood pressure goes up or down or your heart rate changes or something like that but what, what, what kind of goes on here in terms of these second messengers and so basically second messengers anything sort of secondary to that uh, drug bind to that receptor whatever happens after that there's usually some sort of molecule that acts as a signaling molecule that's the second messenger the first messenger of course being the the drug itself and that's good morning to everyone who's coming in um so some of the more common ones you're going to run into include things like cyclic amp or cyclic adenosine monophosphate cyclic gmp and then actually calcium is a really important one as well there's another molecule that goes along with calcium called phosphonacetide we'll talk about very briefly here um and so they are typically activated by things like enzymes or you can have like the opening of those ion um, linked receptors right we talked about how they can open up and allow like sodium to flow in or chloride to flow in whatever type of channel it is and these are typically going to be the catalyst to sort of uh, kick off these second messenger systems right so cyclic amp being one of the more common ones i want to mention just first um, we see that this is going to be a common one you see with a lot of different types of hormones so things like glucagon and thyroid stimulating hormone uh, and i'll kind of go through and talk about how cyclic amp sort of works in each of those examples and i'll kind of provide some ways in which drugs do that too right so basically what happens here and you can see this let me use my uh laser pointer here to make it more clear um, so imagine you have a hormone or say for instance you have a drug that's coming along and stimulating this receptor here right this is one of those g protein coupled receptors once that g protein is activated then it actually goes um, and works with adenylate cyclase this is the enzyme that forms that cyclic amp remember this is all an energy dependent process here but uh, basically it's taking atp and converting it over to cyclic amp right again all the intermediary uh, steps here are not really so important to know for our purposes just know that when you have this receptor activated you have the g protein activated you're then going to eventually get some cyclic amp right Dilate cyclase is the enzyme that, that causes that to occur. And then from there, once you have the cyclic AMP, depending on the cell type you're talking about, depending on the um, you know, the tissue you're dealing with, some downstream effect occurs, right? Whether it's stimulating, um, you know, release of a hormone or stimulating, um, you know, growth or whatever the case may be, there's a lot of things that can happen after this. And just know that cyclic AMP is a mediator for a lot of these um, different reactions here. So um, let's talk about a few examples of that. So for instance, cyclic AMP can help us to mobilize energy. So uh, in the liver, if you're familiar with uh, you know, some of the purposes of the liver, we'll talk a lot about that for like drug metabolism. But it's also the storage site for glycogen, which is sort of a, a temporary storage spot for a lot of our glucose. And so say, for instance, you're hypoglycemic, you have low blood sugar, you can have glucagon come along and will stimulate the breakdown of that glycogen and produce new glucose, right? A gluconeogenesis. And that's partly mediated through cyclic AMP as its secondary messenger. Um, we'll also see some cases where like uh, the kidneys can be affected by things like vasopressin. Vasopressin has a couple of different names, but the other name for it is antidiuretic hormone. So antidiuretic means anti-urination essentially. So that helps us to hold on to water. We can see things like calcium homeostasis and the parathyroid can be affected by this as well. And then one of the big ones that you'll see this used with quite frequently is going to be in cardiology. You'll see that um, things like the force of contraction, the, the heart rate, all that can also be affected um, by cyclic AMP, right? So I'll show you some pictorial examples here. Now, this one is a little more complicated than what I really want to show here, but basically I want to show you where you can have some sort of first messenger here. So this is the liver cell, right, the hepatocyte. And so say you have epinephrine being released. Say it's being released from uh, the adrenal glands circulating around the bloodstream, and it comes on and activates this receptor here, right? So this is a G-protein coupled receptor. Um, you know, not only could I be releasing this naturally in my body, but I can give you exogenous epinephrine. I can give you a, a, an injection 
of epinephrine, you know, say like during uh, a cardiac arrest or if you're having an allergic reaction, it's the same thing, right? So anyway, um, basically once this is activated here, there's a whole lot of intermediary steps, but all of it is being mediated through cyclic AMP. Once that sort of kicks off the process here, you can see a number of different things are happening here. The main one that we're caring about here is going to be this release of glucose, right? It's called gluconeogenesis that occurs by the breakdown of glycogen and then that can be released into the bloodstream right so when does that occur well typically like your fight or flight response say for instance a bear were to hop out at you and and you were very scared by that um you're going to need energy to run away from that threat or to fight it as it were and that's where the glucose comes into play right so again psychic like camp being the secondary messenger here Another good example is in the kidney. So here we have a nephron. We're going to talk a lot about these when we get into uh, talking about cardiology and talking about um, diuretics and things like that. But you're going to see that one of the big places where um, uh, vasopressin comes into play is actually going to be within the collecting duct here towards uh, the end of the nephron, right? So basically once we're trying to concentrate the urine, well basically you can have vasopressin being released from the brain. It will then circulate down into the kidneys eventually and you'll have these different receptors that are going to be activated here. This is a big one I want to focus on is V2R. Basically once this gets activated, you'll then see adenylate cyclase gets activated and then boom, here's our CAMP right here, cyclic AMP. Then what you find is that these aquaporin channels actually get inserted into the luminal side of that nephron. So what does an aquaporin channel do? It actually reabsorbs water. So if you're having an anti-diuretic hormone, anti-urination hormone, you probably want to decrease that volume of urine. And one way we can do that is to reabsorb water as it's being filtered and processed through the nephron here. So you can see how vasopressin can come along activate the production of cyclic AMP and then now you're reabsorbing all that water preventing you from urinating okay so again just another example I'm not going to ask you specifically all the intermediary steps here but I want you to understand the process of cyclic AMP being a secondary messenger and then it's responsible for a ton of things in the body right here is uh, the heart. So imagine this is a uh, myocyte here. Here is a sympathetic nerve terminal. And, you know, going back to that fight or flight response. So imagine here we have a sympathetic nerve terminal and you're in that same bear sort of scenario. Typically go with bears, but it could have been alligator since we're in Florida. You never know. Um, but this norepinephrine, uh, nor, excuse me, norepinephrine being released will, can activate these beta adrenergic receptors. I'm sure you've heard of beta blockers before, and we'll, we'll talk about those next semester. But essentially, once you have norepinephrine binding to this beta receptor, you're going to then have adenylate cyclase work, cyclic AMP is formed here. And this is an interesting one because we mentioned calcium being a strong signaling molecule. Calcium is also really important for uh, to allow muscles to work, right? So when we get into the physiology there, you're going to see that calcium is really important for the um, uh, the interaction between actin and myosin to cause not only your skeletal muscle to work, but also your cardiac muscle as well. So this actually allows for more calcium to come into the heart, to the actual myocytes, and that causes a stronger contraction. So norepinephrine is going to cause an increase in the strength of contraction and also the speed of the heart, the rate of how fast it's beating, such that you get more blood pumping, and then boom, you can then get around and, and run away from that threat because you have more blood supplying oxygen to those muscles, right? So again, cyclic AMP being the, the messenger here, the secondary messenger to allow for this whole process to kick off, okay? And again, we can see how these drugs can interact here because again, norepinephrine is a drug that I can give exogenously. It's not just something that we produce ourselves. I can give you an injection of norepi and get the same exact effect here. So similar to cyclic AMP, we have cyclic GMP, which is gonna be responsible for a whole host of other actions here. Um, we frequently deal with this in terms of its effects on um, smooth muscle and actually uh, modulating how um, tightly it's constricting or how loose it's gonna be. So um, smooth muscle is gonna be in all sorts of places. You can find it in the eye, you can find it uh, around the blood vessels. Uh, it's responsible for a huge number of things. The, um, the GI track. So um, this smooth muscle here is going to be really dependent on a lot of factors. Calcium is going to be another important one, like we mentioned with the myocytes. The cyclic GMP is another one here as well. So similar to how we had guanylate cyclase, here we you can see how we have guan, um, adenylate cyclase, excuse me, for the cyclic GMP. Here we have guanylate cyclase for cyclic GMP, okay?
Basically, once you get the CGMP formed here, it's then going to alter the uh, the ability for calcium to come into the cells, and that's going to change how uh, tightly that muscle is constricting or how much it's relaxing here. And so the reason why we care about this so much in terms of drugs is because this works on the blood vessels. And so if you have an area of, say, the body, say, for instance, like the heart, not getting a whole lot of oxygen-rich blood going to it, well, guess what you have happen? Well, that heart's going to start to die off. That's a myocardial infarction, right? And so you're going to see here where drugs that modulate cyclic GMP are super, super important. And I apologize, my phone was vibrating there. I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, but anyway, so here's an example of how this would actually work. So um, here we have an agonist coming in and activating guanylocyclase. And you can see here cyclic GMP being formed, right? This is the secondary messenger in this example. And this is actually going to be causing a number of different things to occur. So for instance, one is going to be regulating how much calcium is flowing into or out of the cell. And so here you can actually find that it allows for calcium to uh, basically decrease in concentration um, here. And so by having less calcium in the cell, you're going to have less uh, actual constriction of the muscle. And this actually allows for this relaxation to occur here, right? Um, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of the drug Viagra before. Uh, its generic name is sildenafil. Uh, most of you know that this is uh, going to be a drug used for, to treat erectile dysfunction, but it can be used for a few other things as well. This was actually an important one here because it's uh, good to have a secondary messenger, but you don't want too much of it, right? So we have to find some way to get rid of that. And so, for instance, here we can have um, an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. We'll actually come and then cleave this, uh, the cyclic GMP, and turn it back to guanosine monophosphate, right? So, again, you want to have regulation here to make sure you don't have too much relaxation in that smooth muscle. And so this is important because actually sildenafil here blocks this enzyme. And so we'll talk about, about more about this later on, but just to give you an example of a real-life drug uh, example, so Denifil blocks this enzyme, and so this actually increases the amount of cyclic GMP we have available. So you have a lot more cyclic GMP around, and what that actually does is uh, cause it to work even better because it's not being metabolized, and so that allows for more smooth muscle relaxation. Where is that important? Well, if you're trying to have an erection, you want more blood flow going to the penis to allow for that to occur, that's what sildenafil does, basically. We can also do this in the lungs, too, um, and use it for things like pulmonary hypertension to allow for better blood flow going through the lungs. So again, the regulatory features here can also be affected to cause, you know, many different physiologic effects. So, but where do we care about this most in terms of cardiology, this is uh, an important one. So let's say we have the drug nitroglycerin, and it'll oftentimes be abbreviated NTG. And basically, uh, nitroglycerin is going to be converted into a, a molecule called nitric oxide, or NO. Um, notice this is not nitrous oxide, that, it, that would be um, laughing gas, but this is nitric oxide. And if we go back to this last slide here, you can see where nitrous oxide is also going to be responsible for regulating the production of cyclic GMP. So it kind of can come from different um, signaling sources, but ultimately it's still the same secondary messenger regulating this, right? So we, um, you know, say we have someone who is running and they're exerting themselves, but they have some, maybe some uh, coronary vessels that are occluded due to uh, atherosclerosis, things like that. All of a sudden he's having chest pain, right? So he's having uh, angina, this exertional chest pain because he's not delivering enough oxygen to the heart. Well, what do we do to affect that? Well, basically, by giving this nitric oxide, it's then going to activate guanylocyclase. That then causes us to synthesize more CGMP. And then this will then cause these downstream effects to occur to ultimately close off those calcium channels, prevent uh, calcium from coming into the cell, and that allows the smooth muscle to relax. So now those blood vessels start to relax. They get bigger, the diameter is bigger, and that allows for more oxygen-rich blood to flow into uh, those vessels. And then, boom, now the heart is getting more oxygen and you should see the angina cease right unless it doesn't cease and then they're having a much bigger problem then you call 911 right um so again just another example of using these secondary messengers with an actual drug that we give all the time <clears throat> so um another important secondary messenger here is calcium itself i've already mentioned a few times there's another molecule that goes along with this called ip3 or inositol triphosphate i'm not going to get super in depth in here in terms of um you know, it's generation and regulation and all of that. Um, but as I mentioned, we'll see that calcium is really important, not just for causing smooth muscle contraction or contraction of the, the myocytes and things like that, but it can also regulate things like neurotransmitters. 
When I say neurotransmitters, I'm talking about things like serotonin and norepinephrine and um, dopamine, things like that. It can affect hormones and growth factors, all sorts of different things here. So this is a really important um, uh, sort of pathway that we can harness to cause a lot of different drug effects, right? So maybe we can use it to affect growth factors in cancer cells and prevent them from replicating. We can do all kinds of things here, right? And so um, but IP3 ultimately itself is also used to mobilize calcium because frequently it's not just calcium coming in from outside of the cell, but frequently our cells have storage spots, right? So you have things like the sarcoplasmic reticulum and muscle cells and things like that that store a lot of calcium in order to wait for something to come along to activate it to release it to cause whatever effect to, to happen so here's an example here where you could have a signaling molecule activate a g protein coupled receptor um, again don't get too caught up in the intermediary steps here but ultimately what we end up having is this ip3 is formed and this then allows for this calcium to open up and come out of the endoplasmic reticulum to then have whatever effects it's going to have, whether it's um, to release insulin or to change growth factors or whatever the case may be. So you can see here how this is uh, another important uh, sort of intermediary step. It's not just calcium coming from outside of the cell, like what we saw with the uh, vascular smooth muscle, but it can also come from within the cell in these endoplasmic reticulum storage spots. So... Ultimately, uh, things get complicated, right? So for every cell or uh, tissue type, you're gonna find that there are a number of sort of checks and balances in place. You're gonna have things that can work as agonist and have a positive effect. You can have things work as antagonist and have sort of a negative effect. Um, and you wanna be able to regulate this. And, and it's important for the body to have multiple ways to do this um, because one process may be inhibited or may be changed due to disease or something like that. So just to give you an example here, let's imagine um, we have a vascular smooth muscle cell, right? So again, going back to cardiology here, you can see there's a number of different things that can affect its ability to relax or contract, which is important depending on the situation, right? So uh, for instance here, we can have things like epinephrine activating beta-2 receptors, and that causes relaxation to occur through cyclic AMP, right? We can have things like... <clears throat> acetylcholine come and bind to muscarinic receptors and that will then stimulate nitric oxide to be released and we know that affects like the gmp and that also causes relaxation right two different secondary messengers causing the same effect here or we could have the opposite right you could have things like norepinephrine working through ip3 to release calcium and that causes contraction right or you could have these actual cells uh these ion channels here open up to allow calcium to flow in so um, and we'll talk a lot about ANG2, angiotensin 2 later on when we get into the cardiology section next semester. But ultimately, and again, this, cell is, uh, this uh, slide's quite busy, but the main point to be is that there are going to be agonists or antagonists, and it's really important to have different means of affecting these systems here because we're going to find that we can have different drugs come into play here, right? So I can have things that block these beta-2 receptors. I can do things that uh, decrease the amount of angiotensin 2 available. I can block calcium channels. I'm sure you've heard of calcium channel blockers before. So there are going to be a myriad ways to affect these different systems, and we will learn about most of them next semester. But again, I'm just trying to introduce you to the concept now. So Enough of that, let's get into what we call dose-response relationships. So what do we mean by this? Well, basically, um, imagine you were trying to run a study and you were trying to see um, how or if a new drug actually works. And so these are typically done by drug companies and sort of what we call it the preclinical sort of setting. Um, and basically what they'll do is they will either have a tissue or an animal or something like that, and it will administer different doses of a drug, right? Um, we could do this in people, we could do this in you know, the actual tissues, it doesn't really matter. But um, the point being is that we want to see that by changing the concentration of the drug, you should see a sort of, uh, sort of a, um, a relationship there between the magnitude of response and that dose of drug, right? So presumably if I'm giving something that lowers blood pressure, if I give a bigger dose of that drug, I should get a bigger drop in blood pressure, right? Fairly straightforward. So let's talk more about um, specifically um, how we can show that and sort of what these graphs sort of look like and how that sort of has a relationship between the drug and the actual number of receptors we have available, kind of the, the fraction of them that are being bound and all of that, okay? And so again, this is really important because we wanna know, well, how much of a drug do I need to give to get the effect that I'm looking for, right? So um, you wanna uh, see, okay, I don't you know, wanna lower blood pressure, I don't wanna lower it too much, 
because then you have hypotension that can be similarly problematic for patients just like hypertension can be an issue okay and so we're going to look at some of these dose response relationships to kind of have an idea of how well these drugs are going to be working for our patients so basically when you start out when you're testing a potential drug, you want to be able to show sort of three things. So one, you want to start in sort of a neutral state saying that if the drug isn't there, you really shouldn't get any effect. So if I'm not giving any drug, you shouldn't see any decrease in blood pressure. That makes pretty good sense. Um, we'll talk more about placebo effect later on, but this is certainly something we want to test for in human studies is to make sure that by people taking, say, um, a sugar pill, um, that they're not going to see any changes in blood pressure. But the mind is quite powerful and you can actually find that placebo effect is a real thing but we'll talk more about that later so no drug no effect pretty straightforward uh, by adding more of a drug you should see incremental changes in effect so if i'm giving more of that drug i should see bigger drops in blood pressure to occur and then when you take that drug away you should have everything go back to baseline so removing the drug causes the blood pressure to go back to the pre-medicated level okay Again, this is not rocket science at this point, but we'll see how it gets a little bit more complicated as we go forward. And so what that should look like are these graphs called a dose response curve. So basically you have the response you're looking for here on the y-axis. This could be blood pressure, it could be um, level of uh, sedation, it could be lots of different things. And then we have the dose of, of the drug that we're administering, so usually the concentration that we're administering. And you should see that as you start to give more and more of a drug, you're gonna get a increase in effect at some point you should get sort of this sort of uh, kind of large increase you start to occupy more and more of those receptors and eventually you're going to plateau out why do we plateau out well that's because we are getting to a point where all of the receptors are being occupied so at a point where 100 percent of the receptors are occupied it doesn't matter if i give more drug it's not really going to cause any increase in change because the receptors are occupied you can't do anything else with that right so we'll see that when we're actually clinically dosing this stuff, we may not actually get to this point here. We may be dosing it somewhere back here. And you'll find that a lot of times we're dosing drugs to where the majority of patients should be responding well, but not all of them will, right? There's gonna be a lot of interpatient variability. Certain drugs may just not work very well for certain patients. So as I mentioned here, you can see that the y-axis can be the effect. It can be lots of things. It can be secretion of a hormone, heart rate. I mean, really anything you wanna put there x-axis x-axis is going to be that uh, concentration of the drug so a couple terms that we use when we are looking at uh, our dose response curves first one is going to be ed50 this means the median effective dose or basically the dose at which 50 percent of the population or sample manifests a given effect okay so what does that mean basically you are administering the drug you want to see at which point you get to the halfway mark where 50% of the effect you're looking for is achieved or 50% um, of the people that are uh, achieving a certain effect occurs here. So for instance, if by giving a drug, the maximal effect that I can get is say a 20 millimeter drop in blood pressure, for instance, at the point where I get a 10 millimeter mercury drop of blood pressure would be the ED50. Okay, so basically just the halfway mark. And we'll talk about why we care about this in a little bit because ultimately, imagine if this is like 50% of like individuals responding. I don't wanna give a drug at a dose where only 50% of people get the effect I'm looking for. I don't really wanna tell my patients, well, it's 50-50, this is gonna work. They usually want a little bit better, um, you know, sort of uh, assurances from me that the drug you're giving them is, is gonna be a good one that actually works. But this is gonna be useful as sort of a comparison point between different drugs as we'll see in just a little bit. So basically, uh, the other four standard parameters we're going to find here is the baseline response. This should be the bottom of the curve where no drug is being given. You're going to have the maximum re response where you're going to have maximum occupancy of the receptors, right? So 100% occupancy there. And then we talked about the ED50 here being sort of that midway point where you're getting 50% of the effect you're looking at, the effect or response. And then the slope is important too. So the slope can tell you a lot of things too. So how steep or how... Um, uh, sort of sh shallow it is, is going to be based off of how big of a change you get over small changes in dose. So you can have drugs to where um, even small increases can have really large effects. And then there's some drugs that can have huge increases in dose and you really don't see much change. And again, this is very much on a drug by drug sort of basis there, but that slope is going to be important as we'll see in a moment. So 
there's two ways we can describe this. I'll go through both of these uh, briefly here. So one's a graded response or this arithmetic um, sort of response here. This is where if you were giving a drug to like a single person and then you're documenting that change in effect over the changes in concentration. We'll see that in a moment. And then we'll look at the quantile responses. This is sort of an all or none sort of phenomenon where if we're giving a drug, we're looking for a specific effect in a population. Um, this will make more sense when I talk about the actual examples in, in just a moment. So again, looking at the graded dose response curve for that arithmetic one, um, basically as the concentration of that drug increases, you should be seeing um, the magnitude of its effect increasing as well, right? And again, this is like in the single tissue sample or a single person, we're gonna be documenting this uh, relationship here between dose and, and the response we're getting. It should be a continuous relationship as well. Um, and so we can kind of look at this as a mathematical sort of example here, um, where basically the drug plus receptor equals drug receptor complex. This is where you're getting that effect. The more you are causing this to occur, the more that the drug is interacting with that receptor, the more effect you should see. And again, just like in chemistry, if I put more agents here on this side, I'm going to be able to push the reaction over here to this side, which means if I give more drug, I'm going to get more receptors occupied. And then here we have the actual effect occurring. Okay. Again, max response is when all those receptors are being occupied. So uh, Nisha was saying, and I apologize if I said that incorrectly, um, how does the dose response and drug resistance uh, correlate? Is there a change in receptors or just the metabolism? That's a good question. So we can see changes in dose response um, due to both of those things, right? So you could have changes in receptors to where they're upregulating or downregulating. In some cases, you can actually have the body responding to that drug by uh, increasing its metabolism in some cases um, by increasing the amount of enzymes we have available. Um, we'll get more into that as we get into um, the pharmacokinetic discussion. So sort of hang on to that question, um, but the answer is yes to, to both of those. We'll see that in just a little bit. So, um, and again, when I'm looking at this, I should see a continuous and sort of gradual effect here. Again, how gradual that effect is, is based on that slope of that curve, how steep or shallow it is. Um, and we're going to see that as compared to a quantile response, that's really more of an all or nothing sort of uh, thing here. So um, again, let's look at this graded dose response relationship here. Uh, we'll see this in a graph in just a moment. Um, but again, looking at this, uh, as I mentioned, maximum response is produced when all the receptors are occupied that are there half max response should be 50% of the functional receptors here, right? And here we're talking about like full agonists for the most part. And we'll see how, um, what a partial agonist might look like in comparison. So, um, and again, by using these, and again, clinically, these aren't super important for our purposes, but it does illustrate the, the effects here in terms of potency and then for the efficacy we're gonna be looking at. And if you recall from last week, we said potency basically means how much of a drug do I need to get the effect I'm looking for. Things with a very high potency need very small amounts of drug to get the effect I'm looking for. Things that are low potency need a lot of drug, right? The efficacy though, this is gonna be important in terms of clinically how effective a drug is, is gonna be how high this curve is gonna go in terms of how big of an effect I'm looking for, okay? And so these uh, dose response curves are handy because I can use this information and then compare it with other drugs. Right? So I can compare drug A to drug B and see which one is more potent. I can see which one is more efficacious potentially. And that does matter because, um, again, when I'm looking at the dose of a drug I'm administering, you want to make sure that that is um, going to be appropriate based off what we're looking at. If you recall, potency differences, I was talking about morphine needing a few milligrams to get an effect you're looking for. Fentanyl only needs micrograms. You don't want to switch those up and give milligrams of fentanyl to kill somebody. You don't want to give micrograms of morphine because they won't get any effect out of it. And then we can also look at the efficacy overall as well. And so, um, again, the potency is referring to that amount of drug needed to get the effect. And then again, it could be pain relief, like in the uh, case of opioids, like I mentioned, blood pressure lowering, whatever the case may be. Um, and then how much of an effect we can get at that effect in this is going to be really important for your purposes because you want to know, is the drug going to be effective enough for the thing that I'm trying to do for lowering pain, treating blood pressure, their hyperlipidemia, whatever the case may be, okay? So looking at potency specifically, again, we can see that the further you shift this curve to the left, the more potent the drug is. That means because I have a lower dose I'm administering to get a higher effect. And so again, if I was comparing the ED50s between these three drugs, A, B, and C, you would see that A is the most potent drug, B is going to be in the middle, and C is going to be the least potent. I need the most amount of drug here to get the same effect as I would get out of either A or B, right? So C would be the least potent. 
Um, notice here the efficacy is identical between them. They all can be equally efficacious. It just is going to require a lot more drug C to get that same effect. Doesn't really matter to you so much, but that does illustrate why when you're looking up the doses of drugs in a textbook or something, um, you're going to see that, okay, well, why do I give grams of this drug and milligrams of this drug? And it has to do with their relative potency to one another in order to get the efficacy you're looking for, okay? And again, just goes to show you that, you know, why we dose drugs differently. A lot of it has to do with how potent the drugs are to get that effect we're looking for. So looking here, you can see if I was to compare four drugs together, a, B, C, and D. We're going to use the ED50s in order to determine how uh, potent each one of these are. And so obviously you can see here the further to the left it is, the more potent the drug is. So A would obviously be the most potent drug we have available to us, right? Because again, it has the ED50 furthest to the left. B would sort of be second most potent. C and then follow, uh, followed by D. D would be the least potent drug out of these, okay? And so um, basically it would mean to, for a given effect, I'd have to give the most amount of drug for drug D as I would, in, as compared to like say drug A, I'd have to give a lot less of it to get that, get the ED50 achieved, okay? And of course you can see the rank potency down here, A is uh, gonna be more potent than B than C than D, okay? But you are a clinician, you care about efficacy, right? You're like, I don't really care what the dose is. I look it up, I find out what the dose is, and that's what I'm going to give you. I care about how effective the drug is. And I, I can sympathize with you for that. So looking at the uh, ability for the drug to produce an effect is basically its efficacy. So we said that agonists have positive efficacy. Uh, again, it's going to activate the receptor to cause some sort of change. We're going to see antagonist. If you recall, we talked about naloxone or Narcan being an antagonist having zero or no efficacy, right? Because it's blocking the receptor, you shouldn't see any sort of effect out of that, right? Which is a good thing if you have someone who's overdosing on an opioid, you want to block that effect and have them wake back up and start breathing again. So looking at these, we can look to compare the efficacies of these different drugs here. And again, the more efficacious drugs are going to be the ones that have a higher maximum point here, right? So the higher the effect is, the more efficacious the drug's going to be. And so if you were to compare these together, you could say that, okay, well, A and C appear to be equally efficacious. They both have the same uh, sort of max effect you can get here. B and D would be less effective, right? So maybe this is only a partial agonist. Maybe, um, you know, it's not uh, binding as tightly. Who knows? It could be a million different reasons. But mainly saying that B is going to be less effective than A. D is going to be less effective than C, right? Now, you can also look at the potencies too. You could say, well, A is a lot more potent than drug C is, but that really doesn't matter to us because they can both have the same efficacious effect, right? And so um, that just means that in the dosing handbooks, you might find that I'm giving mil uh, micrograms of drug A, but I'm going to have to give milligrams of drug C to get the same effect. But as long as I get the effect, that's what I'm looking for, right? So, um, and again, you're going to see that um, efficacy is relatively important because, again, if I'm trying to lower a patient's blood pressure, say their blood pressure is sitting at, you know, 140 over 100, and I want it to be 120 over 80, if drug B is only going to give me a 10 millimeter of mercury drop in blood pressure, that's not going to be good enough, right? I need to give drug A or C to get that 20 millimeter mercury drop there. So, and you'll find that too, that when you're working, you'll see that certain drugs are just more efficacious than others, you know? It doesn't mean drug B is a bad drug. It just depends on how much of an effect you're actually looking for. So for instance, if someone comes in um, to uh, say the ER and they just had an injury, let's say they broke their leg and the bone's sticking out, and I say, well, you have a lot of pain right now. It's a 10 out of 10. I can see the bone. It's probably pretty painful. Here's some ibuprofen. They're not going to be too happy with you because that drug is just not as efficacious to deal with pain as something like morphine would be. They'd be much more happy to get that dose of morphine because it's much more efficacious as an analgesic, right? On the other side, though, if I had someone came in who skinned their knee and I said, here's some morphine, that's overkill. I don't need that much uh, that efficacious of a drug. I can just give them some ibuprofen and they'll be fine. So again, it's very dependent on the patient, dependent on the situation in terms of how much effect you really need. And we'll get into much more of that in uh, Farm 1 and Farm 2 in the following semesters. Although, if you do get that person with the skin neat morphine, uh, your uh, satisfaction uh, surveys afterwards are going to be fantastic. So, um, but that's not really all that uh, too good of, uh, you know, working, not a good clinical sense. So I wouldn't, would not do that. Um, anywho, so looking at the efficacy here, um, you know, we're using the same uh, curve as before. We we're looking at uh, drugs A, B, C, and D. A, we said, was the most potent out of here. But let's look at the efficacy between the drugs. You can see here which one is most efficacious. Well, drug A and C 
would be equally efficacious. So these, either of these would be able to get the same effect. It's just I'd have to give a bigger dose of drug C. Drug B would sort of be uh, coming in second place here in terms of efficacy with drug D being the least efficacious, okay? May still be okay, may still be an effective drug. It just will not get as much of an effect as A or C would, or B would for that matter, okay? So you can see the, the uh, rank order of efficacy down here as well. So looking at um, affinity and intrinsic activity. So this goes to uh, talk about uh, how a drug is interacting with that receptor. So kind of what sort of, uh, how tightly is binding to it and how much activity is occurring once that drug binds to that receptor here, right? And so as we mentioned last week, affinity is a measure of how tightly a drug binds to the receptor, right? So um, could have a low affinity and have a very light sort of binding to it, or have a high affinity and bind really, really tight to it, okay? And so then as we'll see with the action of the drug, it's gonna be um, basically affected by the quantity of drug that reaches the receptor. So how much drug I'm actually putting into the system and that uh, degree of affinity between it and the receptors there. So you may find a drug is, uh, its potency is affected by how tightly it's binding to that receptor. If it's a very tight bind, I may not need very much of the drug to get the effect um, versus if it has low affinity, I may need to put a lot of drug into it in order to cause that association between the drug and the receptor to happen. So, and then looking at intrinsic activity, this is gonna be uh, going back and talking about once that drug is bound, how much of an effect am I gonna to expect to see? Is it a full agonist? Is it a partial agonist? Um, and again, that partial could be, could range, right? It's not just that it's 50% activating and that receptor could be 75, it could be 60, it could be anywhere in between. It depends on the particular drug you're dealing with, right? And remember, antagonists will have only affinity, so antagonists can bind that receptor, but no intrinsic activity, which is what we're looking for in some cases. So for instance, if I have someone who's overdosed on morphine, they have a full agonist on board to bind to those receptors, I would need something to kick that off, so like Narcan, given the naloxone, will come in, kick that morphine off the receptor, and then will bind to it, but has no intrinsic activity because it's an antagonist. And then boom, the patient starts to breathe, they wake up, and everything's good to go, right? So to speak. So that was the, the graded dose response curves. Let's look at the quantal dose response uh, relationship, right? So this is gonna be showing, um, say I was giving uh, doses of a drug to a population, it's like 100 people, right? Um, and I wanna see what percentage of people have the effect that I'm looking for, right? Um, so say for instance, and we'll use uh, the case of anesthesia here. Um, say I wanna look at the number of people who have fallen asleep with a drug, okay? Um, sure, there may be for the individual degrees of sleep, degrees of sedation. But I wanna see, in terms of like 100 people, how many of those people are asleep at a given dose of a drug, right? So uh, when you get into that, it's all or none sort of effect. You're either awake or you're asleep, okay? Yes or no. And so then I can plot that, that percentage of people that have achieved that response on that curve based on the concentration of drug I'm getting there. And ED50 here basically means not when I get 50% of the maximal effect, like we saw with the, uh, the graded dose response curve for like an individual. Here, it's gonna be when 50% of the subjects have the defect I'm looking for. So the dose of drug where 50% of those people fall asleep, that's gonna be my ED50 for a particular anesthetic drug. And so, um, again, and, and this is not to say that, you know, the ED50 in a case like this is going to be the dose that we are giving to patients to, um, to cause the effect we're looking for. Because, again, if I were to have someone going to surgery and I said, there's a 50-50 shot, this drug is going to put you to sleep, but we're going to do surgery anyway, um, that patient is not going to be too happy with you. But, again, it's useful to compare drugs together to look at the efficaciousness of it, look at the, um, the relative potency between different drugs here. Um, what's the typical sample size to establish the ED50? Um, that's a good question. So um, it can depend on sort of what state of drug trials that you're in. So um, remember we talked about like phase one, two, and three clinical trials. Um, usually in the earlier phases, like one and two is when you're trying to establish things like, um, you know, the kinetics of the drug and things like that and, and uh, how well it's going to be working and the safety of it and all that. Um, so maybe like a phase two or three trial, maybe you're doing with like say hundreds of patients or maybe uh, thousands of patients. Depends on the disease that you're trying to treat, depends on, on the drug itself. Frequently, um, this will be done in um, animals beforehand uh, in order to determine that, and that's correlated to, to humans, you know, and again, it's not one-to-one, -one, but that's, that's kind of how they, they try to look at it. So 
Again, it depends on the drug. Um, and while it depends is not a very uh, satisfying answer to students, um, that is one I will frequently give when you ask questions, so please don't be frustrated by that. Um, that is simply the nature of medicine, as, as it were. So um, you'll, you'll hear that quite frequently, not only from me, but likely all, a lot of your other professors. So um, anyway, getting back to the, the quantal dose response here, again, we said this is all or none phenomenon. Sleep is the all effect. Awake is the none effect. And again, when 50% of those patients are asleep, that's the ED50 for that particular drug. And so um, we can also use this to look at other things as well, not just the efficacy of a drug, we could also look at things like the toxicity of a drug. So at what point do 50% of people develop a toxic effect? So let's say, for instance, I'm giving a drug for sleep, but the side effect of it, the toxic effect could be that they stop breathing. It could be the TD50, right? So the percent of people, the dose of drug I have to get to where 50% of the people stop breathing. Now, again, we're not going to be using this kind of dosing in um, in actual people because you know Hippocratic Oath says do no harm, so you don't want to harm people on purpose. But um, we can do this like in animal studies, or you could do this like in tissue studies and things like that. And then certainly, we don't ever want to kill our patients. Um, may happen occasionally, but we don't want to. Um, that's where we get the LD50. That's the I'm sure most people have heard of LD50. It's a lethal dose. or what dose would I have to give to kill off 50% of my subjects? Okay. And so why do we care about this? Why do we know these numbers? Because it helps us to understand how safe a drug is. Not, we, we, you know, we want efficacious drugs, but if my drug is very effective what it does, but it also kills 10% of the patients I give it to, that's not great. And so um, drugs have been pulled off the market before because it's uh, due to this increase in death and things like that. So um, it's an important concept, and we'll look at, at this in just a, a moment here. So imagine that we are giving a drug and we're trying to look at the ED50, the TD50, and then the LD50. Um, ideally, what you're going to find for most drugs is that the ED50 should be the furthest to the left here, right? And, and this is where we'd actually be getting, um, you know, actual drug dosing typically. You're going to see the toxic effect here should be some degree over to the right. And keep in mind, you have to define what toxic effect you're looking at. It could be simply diarrhea. It could be... Um, you know, sedation, it could be whatever, it just depends on the drug and the toxic effect you're looking at. And then hopefully, way over here to the right, you should have the lethal effect, right, the LD50. Um, ideally, you'd never never be dosing here at the LD50 mark, but um, it could happen. Say, for instance, you have someone who overdoses on purpose to end their life. Let's say there's a medical error and someone accidentally gets too big of a dose. That's, that's ha has happened before. Um, but we want to know how far, far to the right these lethal and toxic effects are, right? Ideally, there's a huge distance between the ED50 and the TD and LD50, but for some drugs, we're going to see that that's not the case. So um, a important term we're going to use here is what we call the therapeutic index. And so basically, this is going to be sort of this ratio between the TD50 and the ED50, right? So ideally, you'd like to have a very big distance between these two such that there is no overlap between the two. And I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. Um, and again, basically, what you just do is take your TD50 and divide it by your ED50. The bigger that number is, the less overlap you're going to see here, because that means that TD50 is way over here to the right, versus a very small number means it's going to be further to the left, in which there could be some overlap, such that by giving a drug at a therapeutic concentration, I'm also overlapping with that toxic effect line and getting some toxicity. And guess what? Every drug is going to have some side effects, right? Maybe mild, but it just depends on the drug. But every drug does, okay? Um, and you could also do this with LD50 too. So uh, another way that we can define the therapeutic index is to uh, divide the LD50 uh, by the ED50. And again, you want a very large number here if possible. So, and we call this kind of the margin for safety. It's another way we can define that as well. Uh, again, how big of a difference here between the TD or the LD50? in the ED50. Because um, again, you may be dosing, say, close to here where you may have a number of your patients who are getting uh, the effect you're looking for. But if you notice, there is some overlap here. So you can have some percentage of patients who are actually having um, uh, the effect you're looking at. And so uh, David was asking, um, are there acceptable ranges of overlap? Yeah, there are. Um, you know, depending on the, uh, the toxicity you're talking about, um, that's okay. So for instance, um, you know, you could have something like diphenhydramine or Benadryl, right? That's an antihistamine. Um, we know sedation is a common side effect for that. And so some people use the drug for that purpose. 
although you may be using it for allergies, but we know that there's gonna be some overlap there between the efficacy of working for your allergies and then also the sedation is gonna come along for that. Now, uh, in terms of looking at um, the LD50, you want that to be really far away. If there's really any overlap with the ED50 there, that's probably not gonna be a very good drug, probably not gonna make it to market too easily. Um, but for specific numbers, not really. It, it just depends on the drug and, and the effect you're looking at. Um, Mina says, Kepra has a narrow therapeutic index, right? So I'm glad you brought up narrow therapeutic index and I'm gonna talk about in just a moment here. Kepra actually has a very large therapeutic index. And so I'll, I'll use that as an example here in just a moment. So I'm glad you brought that up. Kepra being uh, the brand name for a drug, uh, the generic is Levetiracetam. Um, it is a drug used as an anti-epileptic, so it's used to treat seizures. So, um, and again, looking at the uh, the comparison of the curves here, again, uh, how much overlap you have is going to tell you that therapeutic index. And again, just TD50 or LD50 divided by ED50 is going to tell us what we need to know here. Larger numbers are safer, okay? Doesn't mean that a small number is going to get a drug off the market. It just means you may have to do some extra monitoring, as we'll see here in just a moment. Um, so again, that uh, therapeutic index just defined here, so you can go back to that, but I've already kind of defined that for you. So let's look at um, some examples here. So we can see that by looking at this, that um, a high therapeutic index is preferred to a low one, because that means it wouldn't take a lot more drug a lot more of it in order to elicit those either toxic or lethal effects as compared to the normal therapeutic uh, dosing, right? So let's take, for instance, the drug diazepam. Diazepam is another drug we use for seizures frequently. Um, it's very hard to really um, kill a patient with diazepam, right? It would take quite a bit of it. And so you may find that looking at the LD50 over the ED50 it could be something like a 100, so somewhat forgiving. Now, it doesn't mean you're not gonna get side effects, at all, but it just means that it's be relatively difficult to kill your patient with it, right? As uh, so compared to something like digoxin, which is an antiarrhythmic, used to treat arrhythmias, um, specifically we use it for CHF, we use it for AFib, things like that. This is what we call having a narrow therapeutic index because it has maybe a two to three therapeutic index, meaning that very small changes in dose could actually potentially lead to arrhythmia, could kill your patient potentially, right? So it doesn't mean we don't use digoxin, it just means that we have to be very cautious with how we use it. Uh, monitoring is really important. We look at drug levels. We'll talk, we have a whole lecture where we talk about uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. And so we'll talk much more about that in depth later on. So, you know, uh, Mina mentioned um, uh, Kepra. Um, similarly, it would have a large therapeutic index. And so um, you can see very large doses of it being given, and patients have relatively low percentage of side effects as compared to some of our older antiepileptics, things like, you know, phenytoin or carbamazepine. And don't get scared off by the drug names. We'll talk all about them next. Uh, actually, we probably will talk about that in the uh, Farm 2 semester. But um, they tend to have, yeah, valproic acid is another one uh, as well. Has, uh, valproic acid is pretty safe. It would have a, a, a more narrow therapeutic index than something like Kepra would because it is more likely to uh, have some side effects that you would have to, to monitor for potentially. So um, in the example of valproic acid, you can see liver toxicity. So I might have to actually monitor ALT and AST, for instance, do liver function tests to see um, is there any toxicity going on there. So yeah, those are, those are really good examples you brought up there. Yeah, um, we'll see with epilepsy. Um, that a lot of the drugs we're dealing with, um, a lot of them have narrow therapeutic indexes, and it's hard to find one that is really um, kind of safe for everybody. But honestly, Kepra actually is a pretty good one. So uh, like I mentioned, narrow therapeutic index just means you have, say, less than, say, a two-fold difference between the median toxic or le lethal dose and the median effective dose, right? We would like to avoid drugs with narrow therapeutic indexes if possible, but it may not always be possible, right? So for instance, um, we would give the drug, the, there's an anticoagulant, meaning it prevents the drug from clotting um, for things like AFib, right? AFib is likely to cause clots that can cause strokes. Um, and so if you had AFib, we'd have to give you the drug Warfarin uh, or Coumadin was the, the brand name for that one. It had a really narrow therapeutic index because by nature, it thins the blood, making it more easy for you to bleed, uh, which is good if you don't want to clot, but too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, right? And so then cause bleeding as being the major side effect with that. And so that's a really narrow therapeutic index. It was really difficult. Um, you'd have to come in, have your INR checked all the time. Um, it's really you know, prone to drug interactions with, uh, with food and other drugs and it's just not great. Nowadays we have safer drugs. We have newer drugs that have a larger therapeutic index. And so if we can, we like to give them those newer drugs 
because they're safer, right? Same thing with things like depression, um, bipolar disorder, all kinds of things we're getting as we get newer drugs. We like them to have larger therapeutic indexes, and so sometimes they'll actually replace some of the old ones. Doesn't mean get rid of the old ones because sometimes we still have to use them. But in general, if we have to monitor the level of a drug to make sure that you're stay, staying within the therapeutic range, so usually using blood levels and things like that, that's called therapeutic drug monitoring. We'll talk more about that in a later lecture in this class. So just to give you some examples, and don't memorize really anything uh, from this slide here in particular, um, but these are examples of narrow therapeutic index drugs. And so just to point out some of the anti-epileptics, things like phenytoin, phenobarbital, carbamazepine, these are things we actually have to measure blood levels of to make sure you're staying within this range, right? We want to make sure you get above the lower range so that way you're in the, the efficacious zone. But we also want to make sure you don't get too high because otherwise you're going to see toxicity, right? So for instance, if I have a patient with epilepsy, and I'm giving them phenytoin, I wanna make sure that they get up to a level above 10 because I wanna make sure they're not gonna have seizures. And then I wanna make sure they don't get to a level above 20 because if they do, then they're gonna have ataxia. Uh, you know, ataxia, they're gonna have um, uh, a lot of dizziness and sedation, a lot of side effects from that. And so we call that a narrow therapeutic index drug because depending on the patient, even small changes in dose could cause these numbers to go outside of this range pretty easily. Excuse me. Um, so anyway, so again, looking at the, the therapeutic index here, um, we can imagine um, two examples. So let's look at things like warfarin, uh, which I mentioned as being the um, anticoagulant, and penicillin, which most people know of um, as being an antibiotic, right? So you use it for uh, uh, bacterial infections. We'll talk a lot about that next semester. Um, but again, looking at this, you can see that there is uh, a degree of overlap with warfarin to where the therapeutic effect of preventing clots is here, um, but again, you're gonna overlap with the unwanted adverse effect of bleeding. And so that's just something we just know about the drug and we have to kind of take the good with the bad in some of those cases there. As compared to penicillin, I'd probably have to give them a whole truckload of the drug before I'd really cause any um, severe toxicity or um, you know death potentially. And so I have a very large therapeutic window. So I can give them even really big doses and I really shouldn't expect to see too many problems as compared to something with a small therapeutic index, okay? Generally, Large therapeutic indexes are going to be better than low ones um, or small ones, but it just really depends on the situation, the disease state, the drugs I have available. There's a million different reasons why that may change. So anyway, uh, in terms of the summary of the curves here, um, we can graph these either linear or semi-logarithmic plots here. A lot of it, um, it just has to do with how you represent the concentrations of drugs and being able to compare the different curves together. Um, but again, what it does allow us to do is to compare drugs, look at things like the therapeutic index of the curve and make sort of rational therapeutic decisions, right? Because again, if I want to go with a drug that has um, relatively low efficacy, but it gets the job done, right? So, um, you know, it's able to get the blood pressure under control or whatever the case may be, that may be an okay drug, right? Um, and again, it does provide us a lot of information about things like potency um, and efficacy. Again, clinically, we care a lot about efficacy to make sure the drug's gonna get the job done. So why could a patient have sort of variability in response? Like why can some patients respond really well to a particular drug? Other patients don't respond very well at all. Um, we're gonna see a lot of factors that go into it. Could be the, um, the size of the patient, could do with the age of the patient, could deal with their genetics. We're gonna see a lot of different reasons for that. And again, if you can look at specific patient factors and predict how someone's gonna respond, and that's gonna be good because then you can just say, okay, well, I don't wanna use this drug because I think they're gonna have a bad response to it. I'm gonna go with this drug instead. You're making sort of rational decisions about how patients may respond to a particular drug, right? Um, this is important for things like, uh, for instance, like hypertension management. You're gonna see that like black patients respond better to certain particular antihypertensive than say like a white patient might, right? Due to some of their genetic differences between um, the two uh, you know, uh, groups, you can see that maybe I'll start with this particular drug versus this other group of drugs. And again, we'll talk about that later, but that's just one example to see, to see how you may find that response there. So let's talk about some, some difference in variations of response, right? So we're gonna talk about a few here. We're gonna talk about idiosyncratic responses. We'll talk about tolerance in a term called tachyphylaxis, and then hyper or hypo-reactive responses. So in cases where patients respond too well to a drug at a given dose or too, um, uh, too little response, uh, as we'll see.
So an idiosyncratic response is going to be sort of a rare or sort of an abnormal response to a uh, drug. And, and basically, it's going to be something that can't really be explained by the pharmacologic action of the drug itself, right? So you give a drug to a patient, you expect it to lower their blood pressure, but all of a sudden now they um, have some random side effect that doesn't really relate back to the action of the drug. That's an idiosyncratic response, very difficult to predict, um, and it cannot really be reproduced with regularity. This is not considered like anaphylaxis. It's sort of a different response altogether, but we'll talk about that later on as well. So not an allergic response, but it's gonna be something to where um, it's an effect that you just wouldn't expect out of that particular drug. Um, and it may or may not be dose dependent. You may find that even relatively small amounts of drug may cause the effect to occur. Um, and you may find that uh, patients have these responses as a result of a genetic predisposition. So a good example of this would be a sort of older drug called Primaquin. Uh, it's a drug we use for malaria. And for certain patients who have a uh, what we call a G6PD deficiency. Basically, it's a deficiency of this enzyme called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And it's something that people may have for all of their lives and they never even know about it unless they have either been tested for it or they've received a drug that has triggered this. Um, but basically, you'd be treating patients for malaria. Uh, say you're in an area where that was more um, prevalent. And all of a sudden, a patient develops hemolysis. Their red blood cells start to lice open and release all their contents. And they have this, uh, we call it a severe hemolytic anemia. Um, you can't predict that. But we also don't check every single patient for G6PD deficiency because it's a relatively rare phenomenon. And there's not like one ethnic group that's going to be more likely to have it than another necessarily to, to know to check for it. So that's what we call an idiosyncratic response that you can see. Now, a hyper or hyporeactive response would be where the intensity of the effect is going to either be increased or diminished as compared to what we would typically expect to see. Um, so good examples of this include like diphenhydramine or Benadryl. So most people probably either taken it or aware of it. It's over the counter. It's a very um, common drug uh, that we use. And so imagine um, for uh, Benadryl, you can see that uh, you typically use it for like, allergies and things like that. Um, but for some patients, you can give them a relatively small dose of Benadryl and they are just knocked out for like the rest of the day. So um, they have a very hyperactive response to that where they get very sleepy very groggy, shouldn't be driving, and they're just out for the count. And patients will know that about themselves when they, when they receive the drug. The opposite could also happen too. So for instance, um, we have some, especially young patients, but um, uh, you can see this with adults too, they get what we call a paradoxical reaction, where instead of expecting to see sleepiness, they actually get really excited. They get really um, anxious and they're bouncing off the walls and it can be really problematic because, um, you know, especially if you're expecting the patient to sleep and all of a sudden now they're wide awake and super wired, um, that, that can be a problem. Again, so a hyper or hyporeactive response. Uh, another example of this would be something like the opioid pain medications. And so um, for certain patients, we can find that changes in their hepatic enzymes. And so we'll talk more about the CYP enzymes a little bit later on, but there's one specific one. And again, when I say polymorphism, that basically means they have a mutation to where they may have uh, increased expression of this particular enzyme, or they have a low expression of the enzyme. And so, um, for instance, there was a case where, or several cases, to where we were giving patients um, a drug called codeine. And if you ever heard of like Tylenol number three, um, uh, Tylenol number three contains a drug called codeine. It's an opioid pain medication. And so the interesting thing with codeine is that it itself is not all that effective for treating pain. But when you convert uh, the body via this enzyme CYP2D6 converts it over into morphine, which is a very good uh, sort of uh, pain reliever. Some patients are going to be poor uh, responders to this drug because they don't really express a lot of CYP2D6. So if you don't express a lot of the enzyme, the enzyme levels are low, you don't convert a lot of codeine over to morphine. So it doesn't really work all that well for you. So you may find a hypoactive response. On the other hand, those certain groups will express a lot of CYP2D6. They're called ultra rapid metabolizers. And they convert a ton of that codeine over into morphine which sounds great because it sounds like the drugs will be more effective, but that's only to a certain point. Um, and so in some cases, we'll see that that can result in excessive sedation or respiratory depression and potentially death. And I'll tell you the example where this occurred. Um, there was uh, some cases to where um, we had patients who had obstructive sleep apnea. These are pediatric patients. And basically they were going in and they were having tonsillectomies done uh, and opening up the airway. Well, what happens when you per uh, perform surgery well, things get swollen, right? And so basically, these patients were being sent home on 
codeine for a pain reliever because it's a relatively minor procedure, but they're getting sent on codeine. And uh, we didn't know, but certain patients expressed way too much CYP2D6. And so they were going to sleep. They already have history of obstructive sleep apnea anyway, and they have the swollen airway to a degree. And now they're converting all this codeine over to morphine. And so they were developing respiratory depression and basically go to sleep. And they never woke up. They died. So because of that, and we don't really have a good way to predict who's going to have, uh, who's going to be a good responder, poor responder. We just said, okay, we're just not going to give codeine to kids anymore. It's just not worth it. We can give other stuff that works more predictably. So sometimes this actually can change how and what drugs we actually use there, right? Um, are there some markers that can make this predictable? David has asked. Um, it depends on the drug. So in some cases, um, for instance, like we can have some patients with warfarin who maybe uh, respond really well to it and some patients who don't respond very well. And some of that has to do with the metabolizing enzymes in the liver as well. And so back when warfarin was really all we had in terms of an oral anticoagulant, and that's just what patients had to be on if they had AFib, um, we were starting to develop more and easily accessible um, genetic tests to see did they produce, uh, did they have a mutation that made them a poor or um, too great of a responder. And so um, that depends. It happens over time. It depends on how many patients may be affected by it. Obviously, if it's something that a lot of people take, they're more likely to go ahead and try to develop tests for that to make it easy and cheap and available. If it's something super rare, um, they're un unlikely to do that. So in this case here, instead of just testing every single patient for CYP2D6 polymorphisms, we just said, let's just not use the drug and not, not worry about it, right? So it depends on the situation, how we actually will tackle that. So up next, uh, talking about the term tolerance here. So tolerance basically means, um, you know, over time, you may see a diminished response to a dose of a drug. Say, for instance, you're getting 20 milligrams of a drug every single day. You take it for years. Over time, you may find that drug's effect will then diminish, okay? So it will not be working as well. You can see this with opioids to where um, you can find patients develop tolerance over time to where they need bigger doses to get the same effect. Um, you can see the benzodiazepines, which are used for sleep or used for uh, anxiety, even stimulants, some of which you may all be using right now. So, you know, you're like, man, I got to wake up for this, uh, this farm lecture, eight o'clock in the morning, who in the heck schedules these things so early, I need to wake up, let me get some caffeine, right? So you get your tea, your coffee, your soda, whatever the case may be. Um, but you'll notice, especially in PA school that you may have to use higher and higher doses of caffeine just to stay awake to cram for that exam the next morning, right? Um, because you develop tolerance to it over time. Uh, I think at this point, my blood is so laden with caffeine that I just use it just to keep myself normal at this point. Um, I don't really get much of a buzz unless I'm like drinking like, you know, some, some cold brew or something from, from Starbucks, right? But there's another term that kind of goes hand in hand with uh, tolerance, and this is called tachyphylaxis. And this is basically meaning that um, even though I try to increase the dose of a drug, and with tolerance, you can keep increasing the dose, and eventually you should get some response back out of it. That's why you can find patients who are like are, are chronic pain patients. Um, they're on in steadily increasing doses of pain relievers um, because they're trying to overcome that tolerance. In some cases, that just doesn't work. And so this is the term called tachyphylaxis. And so basically, you get to a point where even if I keep increasing the dose of drug, I don't get any increase in response. Okay, This is not super common, but you can see this with um, certain types of drugs. So a good example of this is nitroglycerin. We talked about nitroglycerin earlier as being used for chest pain. So you would use it, uh, say, if angina, you're having some myocardial ischemia, you take nitroglycerin for that, right? Well, for some patients, they will take long-acting forms of it. So that way they have some around all the time. But if you ever look up the dosing for, say, like nitroglycerin patches or the ointment, uh, they tell you to do it 12 hours on and 12 hours off. The reason for that is, is if you leave it on for 24 hours at a time, you deplete a lot of the cofactors necessary for that nitric oxide pathway to work. You may deplete things like neurotransmitters. There could be a lot of things happening, but ultimately the drug's not gonna work. So when your patient is then say getting up and moving around, they're becoming active, and then they start to develop chest pain, they try to take their nitroglycerin, it doesn't work, right? It's a pretty scary sign. Um, so that's why they say we'll do it 12 hours on, 12 hours off, and that allows the body time to sort of get back to baseline. And so you'll see that with nitroglycerin. You may see it for other types of drugs as well. So, um, and so in general, there's kind of four uh, mechanisms for how these variation response can occur. Um, so we'll talk about these here. So it could be alteration in how much drug is actually reaching the receptor. We could find that we have variations in endogenous ligand concentrations. We'll talk more about that and what that means in a moment. Um, we can talk about the number and function of receptors. So that's kind of the up or down regulation we talked about. And then you can actually have 
secondary to the receptor, kind of the downstream effects, you can see that you can have changes in those components as well, right? Because remember, the body resists change, right? It likes homeostasis, it likes the normal. Um, so if you try to buck that trend by giving a drug, you may find the body's gonna try to fight back against that. And these are some of those um, responses that uh, are the changes that occur to lead to that response. So looking at the alteration in drug concentration, so this is typically going to be like pharmacokinetic factors that go into this. And so you can find that the body may find ways to change how a drug is absorbed, how it's distributed, how it's metabolized, or how it gets excreted. So a good example of this would be upregulation of hepatic enzymes. Uh, if you're familiar with the liver, it's responsible for a ton of drug metabolism, metabolize lots of things. And so um, there's a drug called carbamazepine that is a drug we use for bipolar disorder. We use it for seizure disorders. Um, but basically, it causes uh, an upregulation in the enzymes that are responsible for metabolizing it. So you'll find that um, as you give the drug, you'll start to find the liver is producing more of those enzymes necessary for metabolizing that drug, which means that if you were to look at the levels of the drug, you'd actually find the start to, if you're given the same dose every day, that the levels will start to trail off because there's more enzymes to metabolize it, right? So when do to overcome that, we give more and more of the drug. So there's actually a dosage titration schedule to where you actually give steadily increasing doses of a drug until you get to a sort of homeostasis point to where that induction is not so much of an issue anymore, right? But other factors could play a role here as well. So we can see things like you know weight and disease states and genetics and all that can play roles here in terms of how much drug actually gets over to the receptor, right, and the actual tissue here. Um, so for instance, you can have changes in, in protein. So we have um, certain genes called multi-drug resistance genes that um, will produce different proteins that actually kick drugs out of the body, for instance. Um, so for instance, we can have upregulation of these genes uh, that produce more of these proteins. And actually, this is a way that cancer cells become resistant to chemotherapy. They can actually say, well, there's too much drug here, it's trying to kill off these cells. Let's go ahead and upregulate this receptor here to kick that drug out of the cell and prevent it from, from working, right? So just like antibiotics, you can become resistant to those, or bugs can become resistant to that, while well, your cancer cells can do that too. And this is just one example. So um, let's look at the endogenous ligand concentration. So let's look at a drug called propranolol. Um, Enderol is the brand name there. And you're gonna see that this is a drug we call a beta blocker, right? And so this basically means that it blocks beta adrenergic receptors, mainly on the heart is where we're really concerned about that. And so if you have states to where um, you have a lot of catecholamines floating around, and I use the term catecholamines, I'm referring to things like norepinephrine and epinephrine, um, this drug will work best when you have high levels of that around. So for instance, instance, um, if I were to have to give a talk in front of, you know, a, a gazillion people, I was going to go on live TV or something, I might get kind of nervous about that. I might have that fight or flight response being triggered and have a lot of norepinephrine and epinephrine floating around, causing my heart rate to go up, right? Well, I can actually take propranolol for that. And, you know, you can use it for stage fright, basically, to help reduce the effect of that uh, epinephrine floating around and basically get my heart rate back down under control, okay? Um, well, if I'm at a state to where I'm just talking to you guys like I am right now, I'm very comfortable doing this. My heart rate should be pretty steady. If I were to take a beta blocker, I probably wouldn't expect to see a whole lot of change, right? So the drug is not necessarily all that less effective. It's just I don't have all the epinephrine to antagonize, right? I don't have um, really any need for it at this point. So um, sometimes it depends on the patient's situation in terms of how well the drug works based on this end endogenous ligand concentration. The endogenous ligand here being epinephrine. So uh, we talked about receptors being able to up or down regulate as a case may be. So obviously if you're looking at um, increases in receptors, that means it's gonna be more responsive to a ligand. If there's a decrease in the number, you're gonna see less response. Um, so for instance here, um, we can see changes in hormones could cause some effects here. So things like thyroid hormones actually increases the number of beta receptors in the heart muscles. So um, when you have someone who has hyperthyroidism, because they have too much thyroid hormone around, you actually find they become more responsive to things like epinephrine. They have more beta receptors, so the heart rate's up, right? If you ever see someone who's hyperthyroid, they're gonna be sweaty and they're gonna have tachycardia and hypertension. It has to do with the upregulation of these receptors such that they're more responsive to things like epinephrine, okay? You're also gonna see things like tachyphylaxis intolerance can also be affected um, or in, uh, be caused by reducing the number of functioning receptors as well. So you can find that uh, you know, if I am activating all these opioid receptors for someone with chronic pain, 
by downregulating the number of receptors available and make that drug less effective. So um, there's also something called desensitization, and this kind of goes along with the um, receptor regulation. And so basically, if I'm repeatedly continuing uh, or repeatedly giving a drug to a patient of an agonist, for instance, um, you're going to see that the responsiveness of those receptors go down. Not just the number necessarily, but even just the, how responsive those particular receptors are can actually go down. The reason for this is is because the cells like to maintain homeostasis and they like to prevent too much excessive stimulation um, because that can eventually lead to things like excitotoxicity. You can see cell damage, lots of different things, and it's basically a defense mechanism, right? So again, the body's trying to maintain homeostasis because it's trying to protect those cells. And so you may find that uh, desensitization can result in that tachyphylaxis. So again, even if I try to give more drug, I'm not gonna get any more effect out of it, right? So the receptors are there, but they may just be unresponsive, right? So it's not that they're completely downregulated, it's just that they're just not gonna be all that responsive to the drug. And so you can kind of uh, see how this would look. So say I'm giving repeated administration of epinephrine. You can see here I give the first dose and I get a good response out of it. But then I give another dose shortly after and I get less response, right? You're getting desensitization to try to protect those cells. But if I give it an hour or so or I give it plenty of time, I can give that drug again and now the cells are resensitized. So again, this is a temporary phenomenon. And you can see this can go back to baseline if you give the uh, proper, appropriate amount of time. And so sometimes we'll also call that a refractory phase or a refractory period where you're going to see that the drugs will be less effective. But by waiting, you're going to get back to your baseline and you should get uh, that increase in response. So um, we also have what we call a rebound phenomenon. So this is an interesting thing that can happen um, to where basically by giving an antagonist, you can find that you're going to cause an upregulation in the number of receptors. But when you take the drug away, you can then find sort of a, a, the increased opposite effect. And I'll, I'll make that make more sense in just a moment here. But let's say we have a patient who's taking a beta blocker for their blood pressure or for their heart rate. And so we give propranolol to slow down the heart rate and to lower the blood pressure, right? It's an antagonist, okay? So by what we talked about last week, we know that if you're blocking receptors, they're not being activated. The body says, okay, well, there's not enough stimulation here. Let's upregulate the amount of receptors available. Well, guess what? All those receptors are getting blocked by the propranolol too, right? So you shouldn't see really any increase in heart rate uh, above that. What happens if you abruptly withdraw that propranolol though? Well, now you got all these extra receptors around and all of them can now be affected. And so you can see an exaggerated response to where is uh, their blood pressure and heart rate may be even higher than when they were before they even got the drug in the first place. Let me show you what that looks like. So imagine um, you have uh, these green triangles are gonna be your epinephrine. The blue, uh, this is sort of the uh, the cell membrane here in purple. And you have the blue squares here are gonna be, or rectangles are gonna be the, uh, the receptors. Well, let's say we go ahead and have normal activation here of these receptors. So your heart rate's 75, blood pressure 145 or 90. Not great, but not terrible, right? Well, let's say we give a beta blocker and then we reduce the heart rate down and we reduce the blood pressure to normal, okay? Everything's looking pretty good. Well, what happens after a while? Well, your body's going to start to upregulate those number of receptors available and you'll have more propranolol come in and then bind these up. But what happens if I take away the propranolol? Let's say someone goes on vacation and forgets their dose at home, for instance. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to find that now there's more receptors to be activated, and now you're going to find a much more exaggerated response. So now the heart rate's 115, blood pressure's up 160 over 95, and there's been cases where um, uh, heart attacks have been caused by abrupt withdrawal of some of these cardiac medications. And so you got to be really careful with those when they come up. And we'll, we'll talk more about the examples when we get to them, um, actually talking about in cardiology uh, next semester. So um, the, the last one here being changes in components sort of downstream of the receptor. Um, this is where you can find maybe changes in the secondary messengers, maybe changes in, uh, for instance, um, other hormonal uh, pathways we're going to see here. Um, and so, for instance, we can look at uh, blood pressure is a really good example of this one. Um, so, uh, and again, it all goes back to homeostasis, right? We all like to um, have, uh, you know, the body maintain its normal, but drugs are trying to change that, so the body resists that. So let's say, for instance, we give a beta blocker to lower blood pressure. Well, Beta blockers actually work in the heart to lower that blood pressure specifically. Um, and so if a patient's blood pressure is not being lowered by a beta blocker, you're going to see um, that the kidneys respond to that. So that decrease in blood pressure, 
to the kidney says, okay, well, I got to get that pressure back up to whatever is normal for it. And so you can see that it has a compensatory response to try to increase that blood pressure again. So it actually goes through what we call the renin angiotensin system to get that blood pressure back up. And so you may find that in some cases, uh, drugs may be limited in how effective they can be based on these secondary systems that get activated, right? Again, don't worry too much about the details here, but just know we're going to talk much more about that later on. Um, let's see. So uh, Christina asks, how is desensitization different from downregulation? Um, they achieve the same thing, but in the case of desensitization, the receptors are still there. They're still present in the same number. Uh, they're just less responsive to the drug. Maybe they've changed your confirmation a little bit. They've changed something. They just don't respond as well to it. Downregulation is you're actually producing less of the receptors. The actual number there on the membrane has gone down. They achieve the same effect. And again, it could be both things happening at the same time, depending on the situation, right? Um, again, clinically, you're going to find that it probably doesn't actually come up all too often. We have to think, okay, am I seeing desensitization or downregulation? But what you're going to find is that your patient's drug isn't working as well. And you know, okay, well, one of these things has occurred. Now I need, what do I need to do about it? Do I need to increase my dose? Do I need to give a different drug? What, is, what the case may be? We'll talk about that. So um, and, uh, one of the things I want to talk about here is clinical selectivity. So looking at beneficial versus toxic effects. Because again, it'd be nice if we had a drug that was uh, you know, completely effective and had no side effects, but we're not going to see that actually occur here. So when I say selectivity, a lot of it has to do with how um, uh, specific it is for affecting the target tissue you're looking at or the very specific receptors. You're going to find some drugs may affect a lot of different types of receptors. You may find some drugs affect a lot of different types of tissues. And it really depends on um, how selective the drug is, and it depends on the dose in some cases here. So good examples of this would be chemotherapeutics and antibiotics, right? Antibiotics are relatively selective for bacterial cells. They, we don't have the same targets as bacteria and such that the drugs will be much more selective for that. So we're gonna find that overall antibiotics less toxic than something like a chemotherapy drug. Chemotherapy drugs can't tell the difference between healthy cells and cancerous cells. And so because of that, they will affect both, which means you can get really bad toxicity. You can see the bone marrow suppression, you can see the hair fallout, you can see um, GI effects, all kinds of nasty stuff because the drugs don't know the difference, right? They're not really smart. We're developing smarter drugs that know the difference or they have very specific targets, but kind of the old school ones, there's no selectivity there, right? Ideally, we'd like to have a very selective drug, but that may not always be available. And so again, selectivity can be measured by actually comparing the affinities of the drug and you can actually look at the ED50s to get an idea of their differences in terms of uh, how well they're working for those patients there. Um, and again, when you're separating the effects, you're looking at the therapeutic, versus those toxic or side effects as they may be termed, right? So let's look at in a case where the beneficial and the toxic effects are mediated through the same receptor, right? The same effector mechanism. And so this is the case where the drug has its intended effect, but it also causes toxicity through that same action. So in the case of warfarin, right? Warfarin is a blood thinner. It's an anticoagulant. It's good because it prevents clots from forming in the atria that can then be sent up into the brain, right? Well, too much toxic or too much blood thinning leads to bleeding, essentially, right? So you can see hemorrhagic strokes instead of a ischemic one. You can see GI bleeds, for instance, right? That's all through the same mechanism. It's just the, the dose is too high. You're getting too much of an effect. Insulin's the same way. Um, insulin's used to lower blood glucose. If I give too much insulin, I'm going to lower the blood glucose. Uh, glucose too much and I get hypoglycemia, right? In this case here, you have to weigh the benefit versus the risk, okay? This is where you have things that may have a narrow therapeutic index, for instance, and you have to monitor it very closely. It just depends on the drug, but here it's through the same mechanism, right? There's ways that this can occur via different tissues or by different effector pathways. So let's say, for instance, um, we give drugs that um, you only want to work in one specific area of the body, right? So let's say you have an asthma exacerbation or a COPD exacerbation. Oftentimes, we give steroids for that, right? Corticosteroids like dexamethasone or prednisone. Um, we would like them, in the case of asthma, to just work in the lungs. But if I'm giving an oral dose of prednisone, guess what? It's going to affect the entire body. So what can that lead to? Well, it can lead to effects in on the blood glucose. I can actually see diabetes, right? It can lead to things like fluid retention. It could be bad for CHF patients. And so there's ways to get around that occasionally. So for instance, I can give lower doses just to, to, give, um, to get just the effect I'm looking for, right? Um, to try to minimize the side effects. Um, or I could use more directed routes. So for instance, with asthma, um, I could use an inhaled steroid. 
and that way it's only affecting the lungs and sparing the rest of the tissues potentially. That could be one way to get around it. Um, or I could use drugs with alternative mechanisms of action. So instead of using a corticosteroid, I could use something else entirely. Uh, that may not always be possible, but it could be one thing you, you think about. So um, again, here when you're looking at different types of receptors, so that one we're looking at different types of tissues, here we're looking at different types of receptors. So for example, here we have like epinephrine. Well, this doesn't bind to alpha receptors, but it binds to beta and lots of other different receptors out there in the body. And each one of those has their own separate action, which we'll talk at length about next semester here. Um, in some cases, we can try to make drugs that are more selective though, right? So uh, for instance here, if you ever heard of a COX-2 inhibitor, that's a class of NSAID that is um, trying to spare the stomach some of the toxicity you can see with things like ibuprofen or naproxen. One of the big things you worry about with patients who are chronically taking ibuprofen or other NSAIDs is that it causes uh, GI ulcers to form. You see GI bleeds potentially. And so by using a selective one, it only targets a specific type of enzyme, um, you can help to prevent that potentially, right? Or for instance, if you're looking at um, antihistamines, we talked about diphenhydramine being one good for allergies. Well, that's an H1 blocker, right? H2 blockers are found in the stomach where they produce stomach acid. So you have H2 blockers, things like Zantac, which is actually off the market now, or things like diphenhydramine, which is an H1 blocker. So again, depending on the drug you're dealing with, it could be selected for one specific type of receptor or one specific type of enzyme. It really just depends on the, uh, on the case. And sometimes you can actually find that drugs, um, based off their side effects, you can actually get a new therapeutic effect, right? Not every side effect could be a bad thing. So here's an example of minoxidil or Rogaine, and most of you probably already know where, what uh, Rogaine is used for, typically caused to increase hair growth, right? So you apply it topically, and it can deal with things like male pattern baldness potentially, right? Um, well, originally it was used as a blood pressure medication, right? Originally it was used to try to lower blood pressure. It wasn't very good at doing that. It actually was a pretty crummy antihypertensive, but what they found was during the trials, they found, well, like people are having hypertrichosis. They're getting this hair growth occurring here. So I said, well, okay, well, it's not good as antihypertensive. Let's use it for this other thing, okay? So sometimes you can find new indications for medications uh, based off of these uh, sort of ancillary effects here. And so clinically, um, when we're selecting a drug here, we have to take all these things into account, right? We have to think about things like side effects and, and durations of effect and toxicities and all of that. And so again, it's not just a question of what's the most potent drug or what's the most efficacious drug. You gotta factor all these other things into it. And again, that's what Farm 1 and 2 are gonna be about, is trying to figure out, okay, well, what's gonna be the best drug for my particular patient you're dealing with, right? So we're gonna look at um, how we treat all kinds of different disease states and get into those specifics next semester. So. That is it for this section. I probably finished a little earlier. I'm used to doing this in person where I can ask you a lot of questions and that kind of slows things down a little bit. Um, but again, this will be recorded and posted up so you can you can watch all that later if you missed anything. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I'm gonna look at the board over here to see if there's anything. And again, I don't see any questions on the sticky board. I did answer that one from last week that popped up towards the end there, but. Um, let's see. So David asks, in a case of desensitization, if you need a continual effect, would you be able to alternate drugs that the pharmacokinetics are different? Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of an example of where that would occur. So not necessarily. You may find that um, in the case of desensitization, you can just modify the dose. So for instance, um, you know, if you're giving a, uh, uh, say you have a patient who is um, critically ill, they get admitted to the ICU and they have to be intubated, right? So you put a, a breathing tube down their throat, um, you're breathing for them. Well, patients need to be sedated when they're doing that, right? So typically they get put on to an IV um, sedation agent. So for instance, something like propofol, if you're familiar, that's what the drug that killed Michael Jackson. Uh, it's a really good sedative drug, or they may be like on a continuous opioid uh, like a fentanyl and like a benzodiazepine, like Versed or midazolam, right? So it may be on a couple of different drugs there to keep them asleep. Um, and so you'll see the desensitization occur there to where um, maybe I'm giving a continuous amount of drug for like a week or something, but all of a sudden patients start moving around, kind of starting to, um, you know, move, uh, wake up a little bit. Um, that's part of that desensitization or that tolerance that can occur. And so to overcome that, guess what do I do? Well, I just give them more drug, right? Some cases you may find you want to give them what they call a drug holiday. You may switch over to something else. So if they're on like a fentanyl and Versed drip, and then I guess I switch them over to propofol. That's done occasionally, but not not quite as often. So 
So it just depends on the situation, right? So it depends once again. Um, let's see, Christina asked, do you know of any uh, resources we could use to help reinforce our learning with uh, app applicational questions while we're studying? I asked because uh, I learn best by doing. That's a good question. Um, you can find resources. So there should be um, through your library website, you should be able to access um, a couple of databases. And so uh, there is, I think, Access Medicine that you ha guys have access to. And so you can go there, and uh, that's a really good resource because it has a lot of different textbooks um, that are available. So you can go through there and find things like um, current diagnosis for a lot of different subjects. You can find um, Goodman and Gilman's, which is kind of like the pharmacy Bible, um, so to speak, kind of our, our primary resource. And so uh, from there, you can actually um, go through like case studies. There's questions. You have to sign up for like a free account. Um, I can show you that in more detail later if you need some help. Um, but you can go through and, and answer questions and, and um, do things like that. And you can actually tailor it to specific topics. Um, pharmacodynamics, or uh, this uh, kind of intro to, to uh, clinical pharmacology is difficult because it's more conceptual so there may not be as many resources for specific questions but um, when you get into farm one and two that will be invaluable because that's when we're getting into talking about okay well, what's the best drug to treat hypertension okay what side effects do I have to worry about when I'm uh, you know treating hyperlipidemia you know things like that so that'll become more uh, important there so uh, how would you recommend we best prepare for next week anything you recommend we focus on thank you for bringing that up I forgot to mention the test so the test is going to be during the first hour of the exam it's only 25 questions so i think um i'll figure out what the time frame is for that but basically that uh you'll have that uh probably be you know 30 minutes i imagine or whatever the case may be i'll hammer that out with uh dr murray and then we'll we'll post that up but um Basically, you'll have that first um, hour would just be you guys going to be taking that exam. Uh, 25 questions. Um, know your definitions. Know the concepts we went over. I'm not going to ask you to recall specific examples. So, for instance, I'm not going to ask you what enzyme was it that metabolized codeine into morphine. I'm not going to get that specific. Uh, but you should know the definition of things like tolerance and tachyphylaxis and um, you know, know the difference between an agonist and a, a full agonist and a partial agonist and antagonist, right? Those are the kind of concepts I want you to know. Um, so as long as you are um, you know, reviewing that, you should be fine. Um, again, th these are um, tough tests to write because I can't really give you like a lot of clinical vignettes um, like I can for, for farm one and two. So uh, it's kind of the nature of the beast, unfortunately. But yeah, it'll just go over this first two lectures here. Um, it should be pretty breezy, only 25 questions. So um, there's that. I, I am gonna have to make a small adjustment to the syllabus. Um, I think in years past, we've had like 3% that was for like a professionalism grade. I think that's being removed. So I'm probably going to add like a point uh, onto the assignments most likely. So you'll see uh, an adjustment in the syllabus based off of that. It's only 3% of your total grade, so it shouldn't make all that big of a difference there. So let's see. Any other questions that I can answer for you? It's odd because I only thought there's 30 of you in class, but I have 32 viewers, so I wonder who the extra people are. I hope they enjoy the lecture regardless. Is there anything on the side we should be working towards aside from the test? Um, no, I, we'll talk about the assignments a little bit later on. Um, I want to, as we get into um, the next couple of lectures, that's when we're going to get into like things like the pharmacokinetics. That's where those assignments will be coming into. So hold off on that. Um, they're not due for quite some time. Actually, I'm looking at um, the home page and see the assignments aren't even due till July 24th. So we'll have plenty of time on that one. So don't worry, don't worry about those too much yet. We will get into that, especially with um, lecture three and four. That will become more um, applicable to talk about. Any other questions I can answer for you? If not, um, you're free to go. I'll post this up in the next day or so. Um, and as always, you can always send me any questions you have uh, via email, um, either through Canvas or, or just in my email either way. And I will uh, see you all next week. We'll start um, the stream at 9. So just be aware of that. Um, so you, know, you take the exam at 8, and then we'll, we'll go from there. If there's any changes, I will definitely post that up in the announcement. So um, you'll see that there. Okay. All right. Thank you all, and I will see you all next time.